Hello, everybody. Welcome to TAM 2013's Workshop 4B, Preserving Skeptical History. My name is Daniel Loxton. I'm a writer, researcher, and illustrator for Skeptic Magazine, published by the nonprofit Skeptic Society. I'm the guy who does Junior Skeptic. Uh, I'm, I also write books, uh, including the latest one, co-authored with uh, Donald Prothero, Abominable Science, which we're pre-releasing right here at TAM today. I'm joined by Tim Farley. Tim is a computer software engineer and a regular contributor to the Virtual Skeptics webcast and the Skeptic Society's Skepticality podcast. Tim is the creator of the JREFs Today and Skeptic History uh, app for iOS. He's also the creator of the websites watchtheharm.net and skeptools.com. Tim will be presenting original research for us today, which I'm, I'm very excited about. Susan Gerbeck is the creator of the Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia project, which organizes and coaches people about how to make responsible, well-cited contributions uh, to Wikipedia on topics related to skepticism, fringe science, and the paranormal. She is the co-founder of the Monterey County Skeptics and a steering member of the Independent Investigations Group, the IIG. Robert Schaefer has been a regular contributor and columnist for the Skeptical Inquirer since 1977. He is a co-founder of the Bay Area Skeptics and Skepticism's foremost critic of ufology. He is the author of books including The UFO Verdict, Examining the Evidence, and UFO Sightings, The Evidence. A very special expert participant today is Ray Hyman. <laughs> Ray is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, and the world's most respected critic of parapsychology. In 1976, he was a co-founder of PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, now called CSI, and his involvement in what is now called scientific skepticism goes back decades earlier. Ray is the author of books including The Elusive Quarry, A Scientific Appraisal of Psychical Research, and a co-author of Water Witching USA, a skeptical appraisal of dowsing which was first published in 1959. I'd like to say a few conceptual remarks here, and then we'll go, we'll segue straight into my short presentation about research tools, and then my colleagues will take up the fun stuff about where we have come from and, and what you can do about it. Should scientific skeptics care about history? Uh, you've chosen to attend a workshop with a rather dusty title, Preserving Skeptical History, so I, I imagine that you have opinions about this yourself. But you'd be surprised how often the question comes up in the literature it really breaks down to two different questions. Should skeptics care about preserving or studying our own history? And should we care, and to what extent should we devote resources and time and attention to the study of the history of claims and hoaxes? On the first of those questions, I've invested quite a bit of time in recent years on the exploration of skeptical history because this seemed necessary. There's a lot of skeptical history and it's important to understand our place in that ongoing story. Any serious, Any serious field talks about the hard-won lessons of the past, the state of its own scholarship, and the roadmap for future development. It's important to know something, as skeptics, about what skeptics have learned. But understanding our own history is something of a neglected area in skepticism. It's not just that skeptics sometimes forget or mythologize our own history. Some folks are actually scornful of the very idea of understanding where we have come from. Sometimes the entirety of the last three decades' work and beyond is rejected as the irrelevant province of the old guard, as quaint, obsolete, or unimportant. You won't be surprised that I don't buy this who cares argument, but I'm familiar with it. Such sentiments have been around for a long time, certainly for well over a century. And for this reason, serious students of hoaxes and fringe science claims have often felt a need, to, a need to explain or apologize for the importance of studying our history. As an example, I'm going to offer a comment made by my boss, Michael Shermer, back in 1996. Michael had learned from Stephen Jay Gould that a rigorous investigation of, extraordinary, of an extraordinary claim, mesmerism, had once been commissioned by the King of France. It was conducted by some big names in the history of science, including Benjamin Franklin and Antoine Lavoisier. The results were published in 1784 in French. 200 years later, they had still never been translated into English. 
This was a really astonishing bit of neglect on the part of the skeptical literature, and Michael decided to fix it. In 1996, the Commission's report was published in English translation for the very first time in the pages of Skeptic Magazine, and we've since made this available online as well in eSkeptic. This is awesome stuff, but it brings me to Michael's comment about skeptical history. In his introduction to this key source, profoundly relevant right now to ongoing energy claim here, energy healing claims, trained historian Michael Shermer found it necess necessary to argue, it is not a waste of space because the history of skepticism and the skeptical movement should be tracked and recorded as any field should be. And this is the first scientific investigation that we know of into what would today be considered a paranormal or pseudoscientific claim. I find this kind of an amazing thing for a trained historian to feel obligated to say. Now returning to the second question, should skeptics study the history of the paranormal? Here the answer is even simpler. Much of what we call scientific skepticism is the study of the history of the paranormal. Scientific skepticism operates within an empirical framework. It is closely tied to the ethos of science. But most of what we actually do as skeptical investigators is not science. Instead, most of what we do, much of what we do at least, is to ask and sometimes to answer this question. What really happened? What really happened in this case? Was it paranormal or was it something that we can explain? This is fundamentally a historical question. And the tools we use to answer it are very often the tools of historical sleuthing. Often it's not possible to cast light upon a fringe science claim except through historical means. Let me give you a quick example. Many of you are familiar with this iconic 1967 film still, allegedly depicting a Sasquatch. I argue something in Abominable Science, which will be unpopular with skeptics and with pro proponents alike. No one knows if this film shows a Sasquatch or a guy in a suit. That is, the film itself cannot tell us. As evidence, the film is consistent with a monster or a guy in a suit. We can't do any experiment or make any observation that will specifically tell us what happened in this one-off event in the past. But we can place the film in its historical context, and this can help us to evaluate the paranormal claim at the heart of it. It is important to know, for example, that a man named William Rowe described a nearly identical encounter with a nearly identical monster 10 years before the Patterson-Gimlin film was created. It's also important to know that Patterson not only was familiar with the Roe case, but had personally drawn had personally drawn this picture, which looks for all the world like a storyboard for his never replicated film. If this case is ever demonst demonstrated once and for all to be a hoax, it will be historical evidence that settles it. A confession from the surviving uh, one of the two filmmakers, or the, describe, uh, the discovery of a suit that was used in the film. So history matters to skeptics. Historical sleuthing is part of who we are. So how do we do this? I'm going to give you a lightning tour of a few of the tools I use for my work on junior skeptic and other projects. I should emphasize that I'm not a trained historian. Uh, my training is in visual art and in sheep herding. But writing for Skeptic has forced me to pick up a few tricks, cobble together a few tricks along the way. My major strategy is pretty straightforward. Read a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's just no getting around this. Acquiring deep knowledge about skepticism in general or any paranormal subtopic in specific requires a substantial ongoing investment of engaged active research. It isn't enough to pick up some talking points from podcasts or blogs. You have to dig down. And it matters what you dig down into. To get to the bottom of things, you have to go to the bottom of things, to the roots. But how to find the roots? Susan's going to tell you more about the power and value of Wikipedia. So I'll just agree here that Wikipedia and the top Google hits are very useful first stops on any new research project. I usually start there, just like anyone else. But some warnings here regarding internet research. Not everything is digitized. You still need paper. Not everything digitized is on Google. Most of the historical information you're after is locked up in specialized archives, often behind paywalls. And not everything relevant is in English. But broad online sources are good for identifying a first round of commonly cited primary and secondary sources. 
Having done that, my next step is to get those sources and read them. Books, journals, newspaper articles. My goal is always to read everything myself so that I know what the originals really said. Then I figure out what sources those sources refer to and I get those. And the chain builds out from there, with one source leading to another, one bibliography leading to the next. Sometimes this is easier said than done. The paranormal literature is infamous for crappy citations and for cut and paste copying from one source to the next. Sometimes the trail gets lost quite quickly or branches out in too many directions to follow. One of the places I look to help me get my bearings is skepticism's primary semi-technical semi periodical literature. Many national and regional groups around the world have published decades of useful material and often this remains locked up on paper offline. The biggest English language publications in North America are The Skeptical Inquirer and Skeptic Magazine. The Skeptical Inquirer has been published continuously since 1976. Skeptic Magazine has been published continuously since 1992, and both magazines have been moving older articles online for free as quickly as their resources allow. Tons of articles are available for free at skeptic.com and psychop.org. Just run a search at either site. Both organizations also sell back issues, and I have a nearly complete collection of, of both. I consult them all the time. In some cases, skeptical publications have collected, collected their entire output in searchable DVD or CD, CD-ROM archives. These are essential resources. These are, these are really cheap, like 30 bucks each kind of thing. These are two collections that I consult routinely. The great power here is searchability. If this quick tour has a theme, that's it. Searchability is the advantage you have that skeptical researchers didn't have even 10 years ago. And newspapers are the bread and butter of historical research. Thankfully, many are now digitized and searchable. But it's hard to really grasp how many thousands and tens of thousands of national, regional, and local newspapers have, have existed over the past three centuries. For this reason, an ecosystem of services and portals have grown up, each offering a little digitized slice a little sliver of the, of the world's output of newspapers. The one I use most often is the ProQuest Historical Newspapers Database. This requires access to a major, a major library portal, but it's immensely powerful. ProQuest allows brute force searching across several major US newspapers at once, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Atlanta Constitution, and others. My other favorite is the Times Digital Archive, that's the Times of London. This was essential for me when running the back trail on mysteries like the Loch Ness Monster or the Crystal Skull of Doom. <laughs> Newspaperarchive.com is a pay service that I subscribe to. It's a bit glitchy technically, the coverage is patchy, but, the, but it archives a vast number of regional newspapers around the world, regional market newspapers that you wouldn't get from another source. I've used many others, some free, some behind paywalls. For my story on the MOA, I use the Free Papers Past archive created by the National Library of New Zealand. Uh, my Mokele and Bembe research was built on the African Newspapers Collection from the Center for Research Libraries. But still, for all this searchability, even now, not everything is digitized. Microfilm is still a thing. I still use it, sometimes you still have to. The research for abominable science involved person weeks of eye strain in dimly lit basements. A lot of my research involves periodicals, but books are just as important, often more so. I've been fairly aggressively growing my junior skeptic research library for the past several years. Whenever I come across a reference to a book that I think might be useful for my research in the future, I make an effort to acquire it, or if it's out of my reach financially, I make a note of it for later. And this involves spending a lot of money. Books are expensive. The problem is that I don't have a lot of money. So, like most skeptical researchers, I face considerable challenges in terms of my financial resources. So how do we find books on a budget? Not everything is digitized, but an incredible number of scanned books are now available and searchable online for free. This is possible because under US copyright law, most sources created before 1923 and some created after are in the public domain. A very powerful tool is Google Books. Google has scanned millions of books, old and new, and this allows you to quickly identify many of the sources that have discussed your topic. Many Google Books allow you to preview a few pages, or at least a snippet. Even better, many allow you to read the entire book for free. 
You can read these books on your desktop, you can search inside them, and you can also link to particular pages in an email or blog post. Most important, you can download these entire books into popular ebook formats or PDF and keep a permanent copy on your desktop. Again, all free. Now, keeping permanent copies is very useful. When I started doing Junior Skeptic, I relied almost entirely on library books. And I quickly ran into the, the limits of that, which is that people ask you questions later that, are, that you can't answer without having that book. So I keep a permanent copy of everything now. Every reference I use, digital or print, or preferably both, except in rare exceptions, but I try to. Google Books is not the only such archive offering free complete books. Another I use often is the Internet Archive, archive.org. This is handy because it offers both scanned PDFs and searchable HTML text. I archive a PDF copy and use that for checking the accuracy of the HTML. And I use the selectable text for my notes. It's faster. Another is Project Gutenberg. Uh, all these are indexed by Google. Just include Gutenberg or archive.org in your search. There are others all over the world, some easy to access, some less so. Um, what if you need or prefer a hard copy of an out-of-print out of book? Most of my research is still done with dead trees. I mark it up with pencil, I fill them with post-its, it's just how I work. One option is to print entire books at home. It's pretty cheap to run off an entire book from a PDF using a laser printer. I do this now and again. It's even cheaper if you print on, on an industrial scale, which has led to a, prolifer a proliferation of print-on-demand book, book uh, vendors. I often order these from, from Amazon. They're a bit of a secret rep weapon for researchers. I order a ton of these, but you have to watch out never to order any that were, used, that were made using optical character recognition, because these are typically full of gibberish. Um, often they mangle the very information you're after, you're after, like names and dates. Always order books that are actually scanned from an original copy. You can buy cheap commercial reprints. A lot of books have been produced over and over again. They've been in print continuously for 100 years or more. Now, I haven't emphasized the library in this talk, awesome as libraries are, because I want permanent copies of everything. But here's a trick I often use for rare books and ephemera held in libraries and archives. Just take pictures. Take pictures with your digital camera. Film is free now. A thousand pictures is the same as one picture. It doesn't matter. Many librarians actually prefer you to take pictures of their collection rather than putting things onto a scanner tray or a Xerox machine because it's easier on the spines of the books. You don't necessarily have to have a big rig. An, an iPhone might do the trick. I fairly often have colleagues who, who have sources that I need. Just take a picture, email it to me. I've got it in two minutes from across the country. My skeptical research relies heavily on used books. And here there is one big secret weapon, abebooks.com formerly called the Advanced Book Exchange. This is a kind of eBay for professional used book dealers. Book dealers from all over the world list their inventory here. You can price, you can search and price compare all of them. I've bought hundreds, literally hundreds of books through Abe Books. It's a great way to find rare sources at reasonable prices, way better than the Amazon marketplace. Sometimes really rare sources. So I'm gonna leave you with a little research victory story. Uh, back in 2005, I was hitting a dead end in my research into the origins of pyramid power. Every pyramid power source told the same canonical origin tale involving a pendulum dowser named Antoine Bovis. According to the story, Bovis had an epiphany while standing inside the Great Pyramid when he noticed that the, car uh, the carcasses of some stray animals were supernaturally preserved. Skeptics had nibbled around the edges of this story, the Danish skeptics in particular, and I had to get some of their stuff translated to see what progress they'd made. But where the hell did the story come from? Did this event happen at all? Who was this guy? Well, Abooks allows you to create wants, like Google Alerts. You can list an automatic search, and it will, if something pops up in their inventory anywhere in the world, it will just send you an email telling you that there, where it is and how much it costs. So I created one for Antoine Bovis early in my research. Near the end, I got an email. A hand-bound package of his self-published 1930s pamphlets had turned up at an antique dealer in Germany. Now, I ordered it half-blind because I don't speak German. The listing was in German. And I had to get it translated because I also don't speak French. <laughs> but it was worth it because Bovis himself, this is the punchline, uh, Bovis himself said that he formed his pyramid ideas through armchair reasoning and occult experiments in France, being unable to go to see the pyramids in person. 
<laughs> the standard story repeated for decades was totally bogus, complete mythology. And that's the good stuff. That's, that's the big payoff for historical research. Learning something that the world has forgotten or perhaps never knew. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tim Farley, and I decided to focus on the history of skeptic conferences, and I'll explain why. I only have a short time to talk, but this was a research project that I did myself. Um, I've been doing, if you follow me on social media, I've been doing these little skeptic history posts I do. It's like today in skeptic history, and little tidbits of information, because I noticed there were a lot of people who were getting into skepticism online who weren't immersed in the history, hadn't done the reading, and it was a nice little sort of entree. Uh, you know, today is James Randi's birthday. Here's some stuff about his biography or whatever. And uh, do, been doing it every day for four years. And as Daniel said, that, relate, that eventually became the JREF iPhone app, so you can have all those little facts in your pocket. It'll pop up. So I started to, uh, last year, started to do some research uh, to augment this database, and I got interested in the idea of conferences. So why conferences? Well, we're at one, but this year is actually the anniversary of a couple of key conferences. The first conference that PSYCOP put on itself um, was done in 1983, and this year is the 30th anniversary of that conference. And the first conference that JREF put on, the first amazing meeting, was 10 years ago this year in January of 2003. So you've got those two anniversaries coming. And then, of course, if you know some of the history of modern skeptical organizations like JREF, PSYCOP, and whatnot, you know that PSYCOP itself was created at a conference uh, called the New Irrationalism uh, in 1976. So conferences are sort of part of our DNA. So I thought, well, let's look at what kind of history are there, what was the first one, you know, maybe that'll get me some interesting facts. And it sort of became a whole project. One of the things I noticed is, is information about conferences is often not preserved uh, because the uh, organizers are focused on running the event. They're focused on going on to the next event. And uh, so they move on to their next event quickly and they throw stuff away. Uh, conferences that have websites often will have this year's information and nothing else. No indication of uh, what the past history of that conference was. So I thought that this was a shame. As an example of that, uh, Jim Lippard told me about a conference that he presented at and I went to Google to find some information about it. It was only 10 years ago here in Vegas, and the only reference to that conference that I can find in Google are Jim's slide decks. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's hard to find this information. But the other reason I was interested in it is the idea of a proxy measurement, kind of measuring skepticism. How much interest is there in skepticism? Because obviously the JREF is very interested in that. Uh, how do we measure the number of skeptics? For a lot of other things like atheists or agnostics or things, there's sort of an overlap with categories um, that people survey, but not really for us. And if you use measurements like magazine uh, subscriptions, you run into problems there because magazines are in a lot of trouble now uh, because people have switched to the internet. If you try to do donors to organizations like JREF, well, that's, that's uh, you know, there's some uh, confounding variables there in terms of, you know, different ca campaigns and, and uh, donations go up and down. And there's no polls that are uh, done that we can leverage off of, like the Pew poll uh, often does things relating to atheism, but not specifically skepticism. If you were here last year, I gave a plenary talk in the big room, and one of my slides was this graph about skeptic podcasts. It was a previous research project I did, just trying to do a census of all the skeptic podcasts there are, just to find out how many there are. And I ran the data in terms of, this is just the number of titles, number of different skeptic podcasts there are. And you can see there's an interesting inflection upward, somewhere around 2008, 2009, it looks like we've had a lot of growth, and it seems to be low leveling off, but of course near the edges of any graph is always a problematic area. And near the left edge of this graph is a big problem because podcasts didn't exist prior to 2004 or so. So I thought, well, maybe we could look at skeptic conferences. They have a, a deeper history and that might tell us some interesting things. So 
Uh, I was nodding a lot when Daniel was talking about research and old books and going through the skeptical inquirers because it was a lot of stuff like that for me, going through back issues, looking at things like the ads for the conferences. Sometimes that was, would be all you had if no one decided to write an article about it after the fact. Um, and archived copies of skeptic websites. He mentioned the Internet Archive in terms of old books, but there's also part of that same archive keeps uh, archived copies of sites that might even be gone. So if it, you can at least find the URL for a site and you know that something existed around a certain time, you can see what that web, you may be able to see what that website looked like at that time. And of course I consulted with a lot of other skeptics. Um, so what did I find? I found between 1976 and the end of this year, the interesting thing about conferences is you know about them a little bit ahead of time, I found just over 500 events. Uh, and they've been held in 25 different countries, uh, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, I know my data is not complete, and I think this is going to be an ongoing project to try to complete this data and fill it in, because I think some other interesting things might come out of it. My scope I limited to scientific skepticism events, events with programming similar to this event. Um, and I limited to multiple speakers and an actual schedule. So for instance, a skeptics in the pub event would not be included or a single speaker one-off type of thing, something with multiple speakers and a schedule. And I specifically limited myself away from atheism, humanism, secular events. Those events are great and have a lot of overlap with this event, but I wanted to focus on scientific skepticism. And this is what I came up, the summary of the data. Uh, you can see that uh, a big focus in Europe and the United States and there's a big cluster of the rationalist organizations in India and of course uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, I ran into another issue that uh, Daniel talked about which is the language barrier. I only speak English well so any country where the websites are not in English I had trouble going through that data so my data for uh, India, I think, is problematic right now. I need to do some work on that and other countries as well. Um, in the stats, the further stats I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on uh, the events that happened in English-speaking, primarily English-speaking countries to kind of steer away from where I know there are problems in the data currently. So here are a few things I discovered. One is that the national organizations are the most consistent, particularly outside the United States. There are places like Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Netherlands, and Hungary that have had annual events like clockwork uh, since the 1980s in some cases. Um, some of the oldest events that are out there. Uh, and if you want to count the quackery organization in the Netherlands, which technically was, you wouldn't have called it a skeptic organization, but it, was, it started in 1881 and pivoted into alternative medicine in the 70s, ironically right around the same time PSYCOP was, uh, uh, came around. And uh, so there's a big, there's a big history there. Um, the pure scientific skepticism events have evolved to kind of mixed events. So particularly in the United States, there's a lot of events that kind of cross that barrier. And I did include, if an event had atheist programming and had skeptical programming, I included that. That's another interesting area where you have to make some interesting decisions in India because what we would call a skeptic event, they would call a rationalist event. And you almost can't have one without having some uh, what we would call atheist type topics here. It's just the nature of that culture and the nature of the problems that they face. Uh, a big new thing since 2007 is Skepticamp, which is what's called an unconference. It's an uncurated conference. There's no central uh, organization that decides what's going to be in that conference. People volunteer and provide the programming themselves. Another really interesting trend that's happening just in the last few years are large free events in the United States. Several organizations have set up events where they do fundraisers and they find other ways to fund uh, flying speakers in and getting their venue and actually offer the event to the public for free. And uh, one event, Skepticon, uh, in Missouri has rivaled the size of TAM with the number of attendees that they get. Um, and the other really interesting thing 
uh, is events inside of other events. And there's several of these, but they started with SkepTrack at DragonCon in Atlanta, which is a skeptical programming track inside a um, science fiction fantasy convention. The idea being, let's bring skepticism to people who might not seek out a skeptical conference. And there's several other ones of those. There's Balticon, there's one at Convergence, and there's Skeptics on the Fringe, which is sort of an event inside an event inside an event, uh, which is interesting in Edinburgh. So here's my data. Again, I focus on the English-speaking countries. Uh, on the two, each pair of bars, the left-hand bar is my total, so that does include the non-English events. Uh, the right-hand bar, or if you can see the color, the green bar, is the English-speaking events. And there's some variability there. I think maybe there are some holes in the data, particularly as you go back uh, in there. Uh, but as you can see, just with the, as with the skeptic podcasts, there does definitely seem to be an inflection upward right around 2009. And maybe, not quite clear, maybe a leveling off in the last year or so. Uh, so by this measure, you would say that we can clearly see that skepticism has grown quite a lot in just in the last four years, five years. And here's where that growth is. These are all events that just started in the last six years. Skeptic Camp, of course, I already mentioned. But all these other titles, there's, I think, 16 titles here. 13 of them are new annual events that have repeated. And two are series of events that are more often than annual. Like Skeptic Camp, there have been uh, 70 of them. And that's it. That's the results of my research. I hope you found it interesting. Hi, I'm Susan Gerbic. Thank you for coming out today. I'll be talking about uh, skepticism using, um, this is more practical of how to do things. And he said push a button. So I'll just push buttons until it does something. A right button, he said. Button. Like you have to be, you have to be able to see the laptop when you're clicking. Sorry, like a TV. Ah, okay. So I have a team of people who edit Wikipedia for skeptical content, uh, guerrilla skepticism in Wikipedia, which is guerrilla skepticism is a term coined by Mark Edward to um, talk about our project of how we try to. Um, really focus on, on topics that are skeptically related. One of the things I'm going to talk to you about today is not necessarily some of the things I've done with, uh, let's say, Bill Maher, Jimmy McCarthy, Sylvia Brown, but talking about um, our skeptical spokespeople because we need to have the backs of our skeptical spokespeople. Does that sound really odd? It sounds odd to me. You guys hearing it? What's wrong? It's not my voice, I promise. You got it? Okay. So um, one of the people we started with is Jerry Andrus. And I got to pick Jerry Andrus because it's my project. And I said, that's what I want to do. So um, I started with Jerry Andrus, who uh, many people from TAM years past um, know this is a dear friend of Ray Hyman's here and James Randi. And if you don't know who Jerry Andrus is, shame on you. You should know who he is. And if you go to his Wikipedia page, you'll see that I wrote this page. It rewrote it. It was already started. and. Um, I decided that we needed to start somewhere and we're going to start with Jerry. So uh, I'm not going to let you sit here and read all these slides because that's just not the way we're going to do things today. So we're going to um, just go through these kind of quickly. But what I have done is I've taxed my language teams and I have 17 languages. We are writing the Wikipedia pages in all languages because it is not all of us that we need to educate here today. We need to educate people outside of our choir and outside of our boundaries and the world needs to know who we are. I thought Jerry Andes would be the perfect person to start with, not only because he's a quintessential skeptic and an all around kind of neat guy, but he uh, invented all his own optical illusions. And he, um, you know, and optical illusions are a great way to spread, uh, spread the love of magics. Um, you know, the idea, it didn't need to be translated in any language either because an optical illusion is an optical illusion in any language, right? So I have these a little out of order, but I'm going to show you very quickly that we have already translated. Oh, this is showing you the, the photos that I have up, uh, had uploaded by the estate of Jerry Andrus. Um, and you'll see that I was able to use some notable people in the pages. And this right here is a picture with um, David Copperfield and Penn and Teller who visited 
um, Jerry Andrus's home, which is called the Castle of Chaos, which uh, the Castle of Chaos was a, uh, is now on the uh, Oregon National Landmark. It's now a landmark because somebody cared and uh, they put it on the landmark. So we have preserved his home and as well as his optical illusions. But I have this on this page and it's very important that we get uh, cite, oops, citations in here. And you can see we have quite a few citations and I'll talk about those in a moment. But we have translated his Wikipedia page into many languages and um, Portuguese, Spanish, and I'm not necessarily, what I'm clicking on is the page. So um, we've also translated to French and Dutch and Russian and Swedish, I believe, if that's not right. And what do you think, guys? Arabic, isn't that great? So we've got this page translated into many different languages. And from these pages, once they're translated, then we can move on from there and start trans and work on other pages that will branch off of these. So that, so that you know how you go to Wikipedia and you go from link to link to link to link? We wanted them to have something to do. So if they start with the Jerry Andrews page, they'll be able to go into the Psychop page, they'll be able to go to James Randi page, Ray Hyman page, blah, 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 and get all of our history down as we go. So really quickly, um, as Daniel was saying, uh, we do not have, um, you know, when we were creating our modern, modern skepticism, we didn't have anybody out there going, hey, good idea, maybe we should keep track of this, maybe we should take notes, maybe somebody should film this or something. No, they didn't know what they were doing back in the day, of, that this was going to be a phenomenon, that we're going to be meeting in Las Vegas in July. They had no concept of this. So what we, what we, <laughs> We have to go back and try to retrace this history and try to recapture it. And I have several ways I've done this because I don't like it when people tell me I can't do things. So um, I'm just going to find a way of doing it. One of the things we've done um, is I take a lot of video. And I have friends that take a lot of video. And we like to get the citations in a way where um, here's a video we, we did of the Jerry Anders table that was here a few years ago. And we've captioned, my language teams have captioned that video in many languages. So that as a citation, if you're reading a Dutch page or a Swedish page or a Russian page or whatever, hopefully my team has gotten through and has uh, translated the video so that citation is much more valid to the person who's reading it. Um, forgot I got to translate. Okay, here's Ray Hyman really quick. I would just want to talk about that. We have I have rewritten uh, Ray Hyman's page, and right now it is already translated into Portuguese. And it will be shortly translated in many more. The goal is to translate everything. So um, I'm always looking for people to help us out here. Here's another, um, this is what I was going to say. We can't find our history because a lot of cases it does not exist. So what I've done is I have asked other people, and this is what I do, is to create the videos. These are not fancy. There's nothing smacky, wonderful about any of these things. Uh, this is a video I created just almost on a whim. I sat Ray Hyman and Jim Under down, down, down and I said, um, I have this problem finding a citation that I needed on Ray Hyman's page or Jerry Anders's page or the Skeptic Toolbox page or the whatever page. I know there's, that there's a story out there, but there's no citation for it. So if you sit them down and you interview them, guess what? You have a citation. Nobody's told me I can't do this, so I'm continuing to do it. And so far, nobody's questioned it because you just do it with confidence. That's the way it is. Then you caption it. Then you caption it in other languages. And the next thing you know, you've got citations all over the yin yang. So what I've done is I've done many interviews with Ray Hyman. And not only about Ray Hyman, but uh, Ray Hyman's memories of other people he's known. So we need to make sure we're getting our history down so that we have it for, for, um, for later time. Let's capture this. This is a photo that was uploaded, I believe, by Robert, right? Uh, Robert has been very generous to take some of the old photos that he has um, just had on wherever he had and said, oh, somebody wants use of these photos? And I'm like, yeah. So he uploaded them for us, and we're able to do it. This is Ray Hyman here. Isn't he cute? Um, and, um, and some of the different photos. And you'll find these scattered on some of the pages that I've done work on and my team has worked on. This is Barry Beierstein, uh, a, a hero of mine and a hero of many others. And um, I know Daniel was heavily influenced by Barry Beierstein and a couple other people that I ran into. Oh, um, William B. Davis, uh, the smoking cancer man on um, X-Files. I rewrote his Wikipedia page because he quoted, I had him on Google Alert. I had Barry Beierstein on Google Alert. William B. Davis had mentioned 
that he was a big inspiration for him, so I got in touch with William B. Davis and rewrote his page. But Barry Beierstein is another person that um, we've worked on, and then here's James Alcott, and look at some of the photos we've got up there, nice, nice. And um, this is a photo that DJ Grothy took um, and uploaded for me as well. And you know, we don't know when, our history, when a photo is gonna be history or what's gonna be important, so we really need to take lots of photos, which I do, and let's get them in places where people can see them and get them so that they can be used and so that they're uh, usable. This is a very important picture in, the, in skepticism. I mean, look at that, that's amazing. There's Ray Hyman, Paul Kurtz, James Randi, and um, Kendrick Frazier right there on the very end, this big smile. So um, this is the Skeptics Toolbox, just uh, linking into what, um, this is my last slide, so you guys are almost done. Uh, this is what Tim Farley was saying about conferences. Yes, our conferences are extremely important, as well as our history. And this is, the Skeptics Toolbox page was extremely difficult to write, and I did this last summer, because guess what? We don't have any history for this. So um, Wikipedia relies on citations. So I had to go out of my way to, I did all the things that Daniel was saying. We went into old magazines, Skeptical Inquirer magazines, and I was looking at the ads, and it was just incredible all the things we had to do to come up with enough citations for, to create the Wikipedia page for the Skeptics Toolbox. But um, there's a couple newspaper articles out there, very, not very many. Um, and I went through and I interviewed everybody I possibly could. Um, James Alcott um, uh, and uh, Ray Hyman, of course, and Lauren Pancras and Harriet Hall and everybody I could think of that had been tied to the Skeptic Toolbox created citations by doing interviews with them and then going back and recreate and then publishing the, the YouTube video and then turning around and citing it again. So this is how I was able to create the Skeptics Toolbox page. This was really a love of mine because this was my first uh, introduction to skepticism was the Skeptics Toolbox, which will be in Eugene, Oregon this August. And hint, hint. So um, we are always recruiting for guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia. I have a need for all of you and probably a thousand more of your friends to help me out in all languages. And if you're interested, you can contact me by any means possible except telepathy, of course. But you, I did give you my business card so as you came in. I'm Susan Gerbic. Thank you very much. Great. All right, I'm Robert Schaefer, going to, uh, I guess I'm sort of a part of skeptic history myself and that I've been with Psychop since, uh, not from the beginning, uh, but from very soon afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I want to take a little different uh, uh, issue here that is uh, skeptic history is more than just recording papers and books and, and interviews and things like that. It's that, but it's more than that um, because it's context is something that's very important. And, to know what was being done, why was it being done. Some of this stuff may look very strange when you look at it from today's perspective, but if you look at it in the context of what was happening back then, you have to, you have to understand that context in order for, to really understand and make sense out of it. <clears throat> the early skeptic movement was PSYCOP really, and nothing but PSYCOP for, oh, 20 years or thereabouts or 15 years was shaped by the paranormal claims that were being made at the time, um, especially in the late 60s and early 70s, there was all this talk about the age of Aquarius and uh, or uh, whatever the new age was going to happen. There was a, a very much a sense that this whole opening up of uh, a new non-material understanding of the universe uh, in the popular culture, not only in the popular culture, but also in, in some scientific uh, uh, areas. There were very serious proposals being made, and more than just proposals, actual work was being done in an organized manner to try to bring things like UFOs, psychic power, and astrology, and so on, into the body of science. And so that's really what, what got PSYCOP started, and. Uh, for example, Alan Hynek, um, Jacques Vallée, James McDonald, and so on, they were scientists uh, in good standing. Um, they were making the claim that UFOs represented a challenge to science, 
Um, there was uh, advocacy of uh, scientific publications, journals, and so on, the popular press, TV, and so on, uh, claiming that, you know, while well, we have all these sightings from credible persons, and so therefore there must be a phenomenon, and so therefore we must, science must study this, science must, you know, set up a thing for UFOs and whatever. Uh, Phil Class went on the warpath uh, over this without any, pretty much by himself. He had no organizational support. There were uh, congressional hearings on UFOs uh, uh, twice, not once, but twice. Uh, one of them headed up by Gerald Ford, who later became president. Um, Carl Sagan was on here, but not really as a strong skeptic. At that point in time, you'll see that he is saying that, well, he, he was merely pointing out that there was nobody else there, that, not nobody else, there was nobody there who was strongly skeptical of extraterrestrial visitations, and he says he, he is not, it's not a view that he agrees with. Later on, he did become uh, much more skeptical. AAAS held a symposium on UFOs, mostly at the urging of the believers that Alan Hynek and James McDonald um, were strongly pushing for this. Hynek wanted to have articles in Science Magazine about UFOs. They let him have a, a letter instead, not an article. Um, a lot of these people were sitting on the fence. They were just, you know, very um, uh, non-committal or very narrowly technical to, you know, talk about aspects of perception or something without really saying whether they thought UFOs belonged in the science or not. The American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics founded a UFO subcommittee, and they were going to stuff it with completely with just with believers. And again, Phil Glass was going on the warpath over this, and finally they included him at the last minute. He was the one uh, skeptical voice on this. I'm just going to hit this thing. Pointed at the screen. Pointed at the screen. And hit to the to the right. right arrow. Well, it's just not going. All right, just hit the right arrow on the keyboard. On the right arrow. Okay, we'll do it that. The right arrow on the keyboard. Left arrow. Right arrow. I didn't. The right arrow didn't go anywhere. All right, if I do F5. All right, that's it. All right. Um, claims of psychic powers were uh, widespread, um, championed by Margaret Mead, who was at the head of the AAAS uh, at that time. This later was challenged by John Wheeler, who uh, said this was a, the decade of permissiveness and to throw the pseudos out, but that uh, didn't go anywhere. There were so many papers supporting Uri Geller and others who supposedly had uh, powers of uh, spoon bending. And, so, of course, Randy, in this case, went on a warpath, largely by himself, at least out in the public eye. There was other going on that uh, people didn't see. There was a pro-ESP show on NOVA, uh, the case of the ESP, which uh, talked about um, remote viewing and so on, and left, the, the, uh, left the, the viewer with the impression that there was this amazing facts about, you know, remote viewing that were being done and, and being used and uh, so again Psychop got really involved in that one. The Pentagon was sponsoring all kinds of research on crazy stuff. Uh, if you read the book, not so much the movie, but the book uh, The Men Who Stare at Goats by uh, John Ronson, I mean you'll read about things like General Stubblebine who thought that uh, he could walk through walls because your body is just, you know, mostly empty space and the atoms and all you had to do was get to the right frame of mind and he would just walk right up to this wall and whap, but convinced that one of these days he was going to be able to successfully walk through it. This is the kind of thing that was going on and it's funny that uh, John Alexander, who it, it turns up in that book in many places, he, they have him sort of like this guy in the background who's pulling the strings, it seems that if it involves a Pentagon and uh, psychic powers and things that Alexander is involved in it. He wrote that uh, this the Army's 1984 study on the uh, human potential uh, techniques uh, said Ray Hyman was the only guy on the uh, committee who really knew anything from the standpoint of psychology and science and whatever, and so he became a virtual leader of the study 
and the person the group turned to for explanation. In other words, he's blaming Ray for the fact that the Pentagon stopped funding this woo and such, which I think he deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> There was also neo-astrology, not astrology, but neo-astrology that was uh, coming up in a big way because uh, uh, this fellow uh, from France, Michel Gauquelin, was a uh, psychologist, but uh, he was going to be a he was going to put astrology on a scientific basis, and this turned into a big thing um, later. It was supposed to be a Mars effect. The Mars effect is supposed to be if you are a sports champion. It is more likely, allegedly, that uh, at the time of your birth that Mars would be in a particular rising quadrant of the sky than if, you know, than if it were just random. And uh, Paul Kurtz criticized the uh, Mars effect in this in the Humanist magazine in 1975. So this is before PSYCOP, but just before PSYCOP. Because really what was happening was Kurtz, who was the editor of the Humanist magazine at the time, started to bring in articles critical of parapsychology, astrology, things like this. So he was kind of turning the humanist into what would later become the Squire, at least in part. Um, Kurtz just said, you know, this, this can't be right. This is, you know, the Mars effect. It has nothing to do with where Mars is when you're born, and whether you're going to be a sports champion or not. Uh, but it turned out, actually, in this particular study, Gawkeland did do it right. When you, do, when you get a big data set, you're going to have all kinds of strange correlations, and they look for every possible correlation they could find. You look for enough correlations, you're going to find one somewhere. And it turned out, at least in that one sample, in that one study, the Mars effect was correct. Well, then Dennis Rawlins, who was one of the PSYCOP fellows, and I think he was a founding fellow, was a, Rawlins a founder? Yeah, he was a, found, a founding fellow. Um, he publishes something called Star Baby, in other words, uh, with the analogy of the Tar Baby that you can't get rid of once you pick it up, and that's essentially what this was. But he was very harsh and critical of everybody, and Kurtz and some of the others who were worked on this, Zalin and Abel and whoever else was working. And uh, um, then Philip Class wrote a response, and that was published in Fate Magazine, which is you know the the biggest uh, magazine for the. New Age and the Wu types. Uh, then Philip Glass, who they, for the most part, a, you know, a UFO skeptic, he wrote Crybaby, accusing Rawlins of uh, misrepresenting the facts about this. There were many subsequent efforts to try to replicate the Mars effect, and they were all, for the most, pre pretty much unsuccessful here. So. Um, but because of this controversy, PSYCOP came up with a policy that doesn't investigate anything. And you can imagine what the critics of PSYCOP had to say. Here is a committee, for, which is a committee for the scientific investigation of claims, and they say we don't investigate anything. People, what gives? Well, that was not a, uh, a good thing. There were also many controversies, and you have to uh, realize what was happening in the context of these things. Marcello Truzzi was a co-founder of PSYCOP along with Paul Kurtz. Um, but he charged later, he left, uh, actually he only stayed with PSYCOP about one year. Um, he charged that uh, PSYCOP was made up of uh, pseudo-skeptics who, uh, uh, what is it, tend to block honest inquiry in my opinion. He says, when an experiment of the paranormal meets the requirements, they uh, they moved the goalposts. Well, where can you find an experiment that actually validates or verifies the psychic claims or paranormal claims? Well, the only one really was the Gawkeland, and that was pretty much looked like just a random thing. So, uh, but Trutzi, he envisioned a very different kind of skeptics organization. He wanted to have the believers, people like Alan Hynek in there, and then we would supposedly have this fruitful dialogue. Um, but most of the skeptics felt this was not a very viable way to go. I, I, uh, Philip Glass used to always say, look, the believers, they have dozens of organizations. If you believe in UFOs or you believe in psychic powers or whatever, you've got plenty of organizations. Where is the organization for the people who don't believe in these things? We've got to have at least one such organization. 
And I think that view pretty much prevailed. Um, just as a, an example of what uh, Trutzi, his thinking at the Encounters in Indian Head uh, conference trying to uh, look into a, essentially just one question was the whole conference. Were Betty and Barney Hill abducted by aliens or is this some sort of a, um, a, a delusion or whatever? And Trucy says, recent controversies initiated by postmodernists and social constructivists about scientific method and its validation process have further eroded confidence in the positivism and materialism that is characteristic of most UFO critics. In other words, he's blaming us for being people who believe in uh, that scientific questions have answers, can have answers. He, to him, it was much too complicated to ask whether or not they were actually abducted by aliens. He could see, how are you going to have a, a, a skeptical organization with a guy like that in charge? I don't see how it's possible. He had his own thing after that. I mean, his own little following in his own publication. Um, we've had other controversies in 1991. Randy left Psychop because, well, he was getting sued everywhere, harassment by Uri Geller, every, not just once or twice, but every jurisdiction where he would go, Geller would then file suit later, you know, claiming that he was liable and whatever. Um, and it really, everybody got the feeling that Kurtz was pushing Randy out, uh, so to basically to try to protect Psychop, so Psychop wouldn't be sued. Um, but it left a lot of people with a very bad feeling of, about how this was done. Of course, then JRF was founded, and so here we are now. It was also uh, a schism. Some people thought this was bad uh, when the Skeptic Society was founded. Uh, there had been a local group there, the Southern California Skeptics, which had um, some bad stuff was going on, and the group uh, found itself leaderless, and so, uh, Michael Shermer basically put together from the ruins of the, what remained of the uh, Southern California skeptics, he put together a skeptic society also in Pasadena because the whole Pasadena connection was there before. And, uh, but some people in uh, PSYCOP uh, didn't like this. And I heard some people grumbling, oh, who does he think he is, you know, founding a skeptic society, his own skeptical group, why, you know, we have a skeptical group here, we, we franchise this, you know, like Colonel Sanders or something, and <laughs> that's how you're supposed to do it. Well, I never felt that way, you know, I felt that uh, the more skeptic groups we have, the better, so anyway. I hope in this short time I've been able to uh, explain, help you see a little bit of the context of what was happening, and. Some people are concerned about, I heard one comment here just the other day about, well, it's good to know that there were schisms and controversies and, and such before. I know, oh my gosh, and, uh, and then Ray, you said something about, well, you've touched on a few of them. You probably know a few more than I do, so <laughs> I'll turn it over to Ray. I can speak from here. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, what Robert had to say was quite interesting and he only touched upon the surface. And these things are complicated. Uh, Kim Scheinberg, who was uh, doing uh, the book on Randy, and now it's bogged down for many reasons, but she went around and interviewed everyone who was involved in the founding of PSYCOP. She interviewed Paul Kurtz, Jim Alcock, uh, me several times, uh, Jerry Andrus, you know, she went around and interviewed everyone she could and what the interesting point was she got a different story, completely different story from everyone. So, uh, okay. So what I want to say, it, it reminds you of that uh, the first modern skeptical organization uh, was May 1st, 1976. We had our organizational meeting and this has been referred to already. and. Um, Psychop started. Now, in that uh, group, unfortunately, many of them are not around anymore, of the original. Uh, Martin Gardner's gone, um, uh, Phil Glass, uh, Georgia Bell, um, uh, and a few others, Paul Kurtz, and so on. Uh, now, if someone came a little bit later, it was still around, that's Susan. <laughs> uh, she's, 
um, but Susan was there during some of our, our awkward situation. In fact, I don't think we ever had an unawkward situation. <laughs> and it's for good reason. Uh, right after we were founded, we, the first issue, soon after we founded, in the fall of 76, uh, the first issue of what now is a skeptical inquiry, but was called a Zetetic, was published. And uh, at that time, Trussi was the editor. And remember, uh, he's written out of history and many other histories we see here, but Trutzi and Paul Kurtz were the co-chairs, first co-chair of, of PSYCOP, and they were the ones who gave the terrible name, Committee for Scientific Investigation of the Claims of the Paranormal, and we never, we tried to pronounce it like Siskip or, you know, but it was our enemies who were very nice, and they gave us, they p told us how to pronounce it, PSYCOP. We were the cops who were uh, trying to oversee PSYCOP. Yeah. So anyway, so it became PSYCOP. But I, I, when I tried to get uh, Kurtz, right at the beginning, very first meeting, our organization meeting, I tried to get him to, and the other group to have a short of sexier name. Paul said, no, we can't do that uh, because we already printed the stationery. <laughs> uh, what's that? Yes, on, on, on small things, on stamps and stuff like that. In fact, our executive com co committee used to meet, uh, bringing people all from all over, Susan from England and so on, Susan Blackmore from England and stuff like that. And we'd spend a lot of our time going over the budget about how much we're gonna spend for stamps and stuff like that. So, uh, so on stuff like that, yes, he was a penny pincher. But when he wanted to have a new center or something like that, he spent all the money in the world. Even in, in, money didn't matter, so. Uh, it was uh, similar to anyone else who was born in, during the Depression. We were penny pinchers on just little things, but not the big things. Okay, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to say, by the way, the very first issue of the Skeptical Inquirer, which was called the Zetetic when he published it, the very first article, and again, that's, some people have repressed that, the very first article was an article by a colleague of Trutzi's, uh, who was a sociologist, and it was an attack on Paul Kurtz, <coughs> And on the campaign against astrology, it was a defense of astrology. So that's how our very first article. <laughs> so you can see already we were having troubles right at the beginning. Uh, and uh, let me s say this: the first issue of the Skeptical Inquirer uh, was a Z, it's a Tedic then, uh, uh, had these objectives. So I want you to read what our objectives were that they would put down here. Listen carefully. Um, to establish a network of people interested in examining claims of the paranormal. Okay, that's the first. Second, to prepare bibliographies of published materials that carefully examine such claims. Third, to encourage and commission research by objective and impartial inquirers in areas where it is needed. Four, to convene conferences and meetings. Five, to publish articles monographs, and books that examine claims of the paranormal. Six, to not reject on a priori grounds antecedent to inquiry any or all such claims, but rather to examine them openly, completely, objectively, and carefully. Okay, now you read those, they seem like harmless enough. I mean, I mean uh, but then you think about it. If I were head of a parapsychological association, or if I were head of a UFO group, uh, I would be happy to have these objectives too. How do they, there's nothing in these objectives to say who we are, why we're here, what we're trying to do, uh, and why we're needed even. There's nothing like that. These are all things to do that other people do, and anyone can run conferences. Okay, so what? That's a great objective, I suppose, to run conferences and meetings, and people do that. Um, so, uh, so already we're in trouble. And my feeling is that uh, everyone this I was, right from the beginning, I was saying, look, let's decide what we want to do, why we're here, what's the problems we're facing, and how we're going to accomplish it. And what are we trying to achieve? And um, they went, was kind to me. They'd listen, and then they'd go on. They'd say, let's have a conference. Let's do this and that. They want to get going. And there were people, uh, I knew Randy, and Ma Randy, Martin Gardner, and I, three of the founders there at that organizational meeting, already had our own organization started in 1973. And so we were pulled in by Marcello, 
uh, I got the impression that Marcello met Kurtz in an elevator and they suddenly said, Let, yeah, let's start Psychop or something like that. But, and Marcello said, okay, I can bring you Ray Hyman, Martin Gardner, and Randy. And Kurtz said, okay, I can bring some guys too. And uh, so we didn't know these other people. No one had been vetted. We met, we formed this group, and immediately before we can say to any, well, these are the objectors. You see these great objectors, uh, harmless objectors, uh, meaningless. And um, we made those objectors, and uh, we went on our ways. And we had all, uh, he's, uh, you heard other people, I could uh, list many, many more other tragedies that happened, or fiascos that happened as a result, that we didn't know each other. For example, one of the first people, one of the original members, he's gone down in history and as, he's not there, he's vanished. But a guy named Professor Zimmerman, he was a colleague of uh, Kurtz, in the uh, philosophy department at um, uh, University of uh, Buffalo. And he was on it to me. How we got there and what, I don't know. But the very first meeting we had after we organized, Randy gave a talk on Yuri Geller, and he bent keys and he bent spoons. He did a good job as usual. And Professor Zimmerman got up. Remember, one of our original founding members gets up and he says, Randy, you're you're very unethical. I, I object completely to what you just did. You bent those keys and you bent those spoons and you claimed you did it by trickery, but you didn't explain how you did it by trickery. And I think you did it psychically and then you're unethical to, 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 to say you did it by trickery. He was, so there, there was already, we, we, I knew we were in trouble because we hadn't vetted him, I'd figure out, and he disappeared. I don't know whether, whether someone got rid of him quickly, but he disappeared, we never saw him again uh, in, in the executive council. And I think he may have realized he was in the wrong council, something like that. And he may have disappeared himself. But anyways, and then, then, then the very first organization meeting after our organization, just after we published the first issue of the Skeptical Inquirer, we met, we had this meeting, and um, uh, suddenly, Tutsi says, uh, you know, they're upset because people saw this first issue, and there is this article, the very first article is a critique of Kurtz and, and astrology, and people saying, what's that article doing in our first issue? And why is it there? And, and Twitty said, of course it should be there. Uh, remember, our journal is supposed to, and our goal is to create a dialogue between believers and non-believers, and this journal should be a journal which half of it should be for, give a voice to the skeptics and half to the believers. And everyone else was aghast. The uh, poor Phil class, I was gonna have a heart attack right then, and there I thought. <laughs> This is the first time we're learning what, what some of us are, are trying to do. And the other thing Kurt, uh, 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 Trutzi said, and also this should be a journal that's gonna be a scholarly journal, it's gonna be an academic journal. And the other said, no, we wanna to talk to the public, to the regular world, we want a, a journal that's gonna reach the public. And, and Trutzi says, oh no, no, it's gonna be academic. And uh, uh, we go on to some other things. Uh, Trutzi had some other ideas about about things which certainly were right opposite of what many of the other members had. But then things got even worse, but we got wrong. We had another member, I won't mention any names anymore, who his idea, and he didn't come out until, um, till, uh, cause no one had specified what they wanted to do. His idea of, is that what I would call militant skepticism. His idea is we go around bashing them people there. And he literally, uh, uh, at one time, he called the president of the University of Toronto at 3 p.m. his time, 3 a.m., I'm sorry, woke him up and berated him because this president of the University of Toronto had not invited uh, this, our member, to be a part of a panel that was being run at the University of Toronto. And he was the world's expert, and that guy should have invited him. And as a result, he got berated. Then a uh, major reporter who was a big supporter of PSYCOP, uh, a major reporter in uh, ca Canada, uh, got hold of uh, our, should I mention his name? <laughs> uh, our, uh, our, uh, anyways, he got hold of him and said, um, uh, asked him what about the story there, and then he, he bawled her out too. He, he, he made it down to, and she made, he made an enemy out of her. And we had other problems with them. But all, none of this, I, I'm saying that a lot of this could have been avoided if right at the very first, we vetted each other, we, we said, what are we trying to do? We, 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 
Uh, in fact, we would have quickly found out that some of us have such extreme views that, <laughs> that they don't go with others. We can't get too far out. Okay, so I could go on to some other things like that, but let me just tell you what the, I want my bottom line to be, the message I want to carry out here. We have been in business for at least 37 years, and um, we have one thing, one goal that seems to be, we all agree to is that we support the scientific method. We like to get evidence and base it on uh, objectivity and science and stuff like that. But at no time that I know of, that, at, as after 37 years, I do not know of any evidence at all that would meet scientific criteria to show that we've had any kind of impact. Now I say any kind of impact because we may be having some impacts, but not the kind of impacts we want to have. But we don't even know we have any. And my feeling, my, my hope is, my plea is, because uh, in another 37 years I certainly won't be around, uh, that we try to do something, at least try and do something, to begin to find ways of measuring and, and how, what we're doing, and by scientific methods. The very attempt to do that means we're going to have to spell out what we're trying to do, what kinds of goals we want to have, long range, short range. Uh, do, we want, uh, uh, do we see our task as informing, or uh, being a resource, uh, or, uh, or persuading, or even proselytizing? Uh, where, where are we? Are we trying to do all these things? What are we trying to accomplish? And how can we operationalize uh, criteria for checking out how well we're doing? Now I know this is a very difficult thing to do, it would be extremely difficult, but my model is uh, what the Germans, what the Americans, what the British did during World War II. They kept coming across situations where they, they wanted to have question, answer questions about how to find uh, German submarines, uh, how to decide where the bombs are gonna come, and all kinds of stuff like that. And standard statistical methods and so on just couldn't do it. They couldn't work on, on, for the, because they had incomplete data, and they had um, uh, only subjective inputs, and they didn't know how to handle it. They got together scholars. They even got people from not just from scientific departments. They got linguists. They got other people. Uh, they brought in um, mathematicians, uh, info, uh, computer technicians, every, everything. And these people did amazing things. They developed all kinds of new techniques. Some of it's still classified. Some of it's only coming, be, being declassified. And I think about that what we do have in a skeptical movement, the people here even, we have a fantastic amount of talent that's being not used, being not used at all to try to handle our problems. We have mathematicians. We have uh, uh, statisticians. We have uh, I information technologists. We have at all. And just to get some of these, to volunteer some of these to help us frame the problem of how we measure our impact, how we just help decide what our impact should be, we want it to be, how we measure it, how we go about finding ways of deciding how well we're doing, I think should be an easy task. Uh, not an easy task, but a, a doable task. And so I hope that before another 37 years is out that we really go get do something towards really defining our goals and finding ways of measuring how well we're doing. Susan. It was a while back. But you look too young for it to be that while back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Hear me? Yeah, great. Um, we, I was just talking about how long ago it was. I joined the executive committee of PSYCOP. I don't remember when it was. And I feel even older because I can't remember a lot of these intrigues you got. Oh, God, I'd forgotten about that. Anyway, when I joined it, I was already on the 
um, committee of the Society for Psychical Research in London. In other words, the major European believers organization um, investigating mediumship and paranormal claims and so on and so on. And the aims and objectives of that society are, if I can go back in my memory, let's hope it'll, the words will just spring out, um, to examine without prejudice or prepossession and in a scientific spirit those faculties of man, either real or supposed, which appear to be inexplicable on any currently recognized hypothesis. Isn't that exactly what PSYCOP yes, was supposed to be that, doing? I think we could have borrowed all our objectives from the Society of Psychical Research. <laughs> so there I was on two committees which claimed to be doing the same thing. And the um, PSYCOP people hated the fact that I you know, went along with some of the believers and was interested in all these whatever. And the uh, SPR people hated the fact that I went along with those wicked skeptics from the other side. And I felt that it wasn't just the Atlantic, I was kind of spread out from one side to the other. Um, so that was just a little memory to give you. Thank you. Yeah, it's called the Internet Wayback Machine. It's, if you go to web.archive.org, they keep basically a copy of everything. They, obviously, it's impossible to get every single web page. Yeah, it's an excellent tool if you need to see something as it looked, you know, six years ago. Of course, you have to know what the URL was to that website. So if it's a defunct website, sometimes it can be problematical to know what to look for. There's no way to search it like you can in Google. But knowing the URL, you can say, all right, I know this URL. Like You could see what the front page of psychop.org looked like uh, five years ago, six years ago, or whatever. So sometimes I look at old, old copies of uh, skeptic.com just to feel good about how much progress we've made. <laughs> So if uh, Psycho didn't do investigations, where did Joe Nichols' work fit into that? Uh, this question about investigations is, is, is funny. I don't know. It, it comes up in many ways. Uh, the position that we took was, uh, I think, a sensible one from the way we looked at it at the time, is uh, the AAAS, the uh, various scientific societies, don't do investigations themselves. They encourage it, sometimes they even support it, they even finance it. We just don't, didn't have the capacity to do in individual investigations at that time. So we, and, and of course, by the way, it's ironic that it came out in, in relation to the uh, Mars Effect controversy. The Mars Effect controversy has nothing to do with PSYCOP. It started uh, seven years before the PSYCOP. Um, uh, uh, Paul Kurtz, uh, uh, Zellin, um, and um, George Bell. Bell, George Bell, the three of them, they got together and they carried out this investigation and we carried it all out. And it, it overlapped a little bit into the family of PSYCOP, but we had nothing to do with it. We knew nothing about it, actually. We had no control except for Paul Kurtz. He was and Paul uh, was serving, simply serving as, since he's not a scientist, he was serving as the uh, sort of the go-between man for Zellin, who was the mathematician statistician. He developed what's called the Zellin test for that, and Georgia Bell. And actually, most of the work was done by George because Zellin was too busy really to do much. And so uh, Paul did most of the work, and he didn't know what he doesn't know the science, but he went back. He went to France and and got records from. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and he came back and he ran the experiments to some extent. But this is all under the guidance of Zellin and Abel, but mostly Abel, George Abel handled all this. Yeah, but the, the point that they were making with that policy was that PSYCOP itself does not do investigations, but the individuals composing PSYCOP can do investigations. So you can't blame PSYCOP for anything that they do. You can only blame them. I, but to me, it was a matter of cost efficiency. We didn't have the, you know, we had uh, limited resources, and where do you put your resources? I said, well, 
Skeptical Inquirer makes a lot of it. We do a lot of good with the Skeptical Inquirer. We also we're serving as a good resource. You know, we provide information for people, and and uh, when reports call, uh, we give. You know, we can find them someone to talk to. That we can do without too much money, but to conduct investigations to build uh, a new uh, center of inquiry in each city of the world is, is very expensive, constant. And uh, so, and also to carry out investigations is very expensive, so. But I don't think uh, I had ever had in mind that we never would say that we never would do them, but, we, but it's not something we do as an organization because it's not what we do. We, we encourage it, we don't do it. It's just like having, uh, you know, uh, well, also, too many cooks spoil the broth. The organization doesn't do research, it's individuals who do research. So, so I don't make a big, I don't know what the big deal is. There are people always looking to make big deals out of something, right? <laughs> do, we, do we have any more questions? And thank you very much, everybody.